Hi everyone. So welcome to another Science Sunday Hangout. This time it's a panel discussion where we are talking about um, the ENCODE project and what what it is, background on gene regulation, everything. And we've got a really um, good panel set up to talk to you about that. So joining me is um, my usual host, Scott Lewis. Hi, everybody. And um, Rajni, who also helps curate Science Sunday, and many of you must be familiar with her already. Hi, everyone. And we also have Josh and Ian, who are our guests. Um, would you guys like to introduce yourselves a bit and say what's your background with genomics and so on? Uh, OK. Um, I'm Ian Baudet. I'm a scientist at the BC Cancer Agency. Um, so right now, I'm, I'm, uh, I work on uh, um, clinical sequencing of uh, cancer uh, patient samples. In the past, I've worked at, uh, we have a genome uh, center here in Vancouver uh, working on um, cancer genomes and that. So I did that for about 10 years before recently. Cool. And Josh? Uh, hi, I'm Josh Witten. Um, I am currently a life sciences and communications consultant. Uh, previously, I worked at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England on genomic regulation of alternative splicing in RNA. Cool. You guys are perfect for this. Thank you. So, yeah. So let's dive in with exactly what we're talking about. Um, what's a gene? How is it regulated? RNA, protein, all that. And um, Rajini, I think you should start this bit and then... Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd be happy to start. And if I could ask uh, Scott to get our first diagram up. I'd like to just begin with um, what's called the central dogma. Uh, can everyone see that image? Yes. All right. So the central dogma of biology states that information flows from DNA to RNA and to protein. Um, and so uh, what an organism will do is to replicate that DNA to make sure that this blueprint is passed on to future generations. And then the information in DNA is copied to RNA, that's called a transcription. It's a transcribed into a message. And um, the message then goes out of the nucleus to the cell, to the protein factories, where it's decoded. Um, uh, and the process is called translation to make proteins. So um, the simplest unit um, of the DNA uh, that codes for such information is called a gene. Um, so uh, uh, before we can talk about the human uh, genome, which a genome is basically the collection of all the genes in an organism and all the other information besides gene, it would be helpful to start with a uh, bacterial gene, which is the simplest. So um, if Scott, if you could move it on to the second graphic that we have prepared. Um, that uh, shows the... Um, a gene of, I can't see it very well, so uh, it, it shows the gene of a bacterium, it's, uh, several genes in fact. And what you can see is that they're simply arranged end to end in tandem. And each gene has a start signal and a stop signal, so you know when to turn it up, when, you know, when to start making it and when to stop making it. Uh, and what's also very convenient about bacterial genes is often they're organized in clusters known as operons. And in this particular case, all of these genes are involved in handling lactose. So it makes sense that they're all turned on together. So in the environment when uh, lactose is introduced, uh, this whole set of genes will come on. So you see that the bacterial genome is very efficient, right? And that's important because bacteria are under enormous selective pressure. Um, they replicate very quickly sometimes as often as 20, once in 20 minutes. So their genome is very compact and efficient. And this is very different when it uh, comes to the human gene. So if you can go on to the next graphic. All right. So what you see here is a single um, human gene. And the first thing you'll notice is that it's broken up into all those colored bits. In fact, it's just those little yellow bits that you see that actually code for protein. And those are separated by those long blue bits called the introns. Okay, so the coding bits are called exons, and the blue bits in between are called the introns. And um, so the gene is basically broken up. And then there are the signals to start and stop, just as 
in the bacteria, and those are shown in red. So you can see there's an extra step involved. So after this information is copied onto RNA, uh, the non-coding parts actually have to be spliced up. Um, so the introns loop and are removed. Um, so then you're just left with the yellow bits, and you can go ahead and make protein. And although this seems very inefficient, it's actually um, evolutionary very important because um, the, uh, first, you can shuffle the exons around to generate new genes. So you can take a function that may be coded by an exon and go attach it to a different exon and make a new protein. Um, and also, uh, you could maybe combine exons 1, 2, and 3 to make one protein and exons 1, 2, and 4 to make a slightly different protein that may have different properties. So. Um, that's sort of the gist of how a human gene is. It's more complicated, but that allows for uh, uh, more degrees of regulation and uh, um, possibilities for evolution. So it's mm -hmm. like Lego blocks, basically. You just use yeah. them to build whatever you want. That's right. So yeah. these exons can shuffle around, and they play an enormously important role in evolution yeah. of proteins. So is there, cause, you know, we're, you're talking that there with the introns and the exons, that you said that the introns are snipped out, and you said it's, it's evolutionary beneficial. Is there, why is it beneficial evolutionary to, to have it that way with the human gene? Uh, because you can have these little pieces joined together in different combinations. So often the exons actually um, uh, signify separate domains, like a separate function. So for example, one particular exon may have the property to uh, hydrolyze ATP, okay, so it's an ATPase. And so that exon is now a unit that if it's moved and attached to a different protein that may have the uh, different exon that may encode the property to bind DNA, now you brought those two functions together, binding DNA and hydrolyzing ATP. So now you have an ATPase that can also attach to DNA, and perhaps now you can add a motor unit to it so it can move along, okay, DNA, mm -hmm. okay? Great. So as, as Budini said, they're like building blocks, okay? So the point of what we're uh, really going to discuss today is that these um, exons and introns together make up only a small part of the genome. So if you can go on to the next graphic. Uh, and you can see the very tiny red bit all the way at the end, somewhere in the 90th percent. So this is just the distribution of the genome, of what it codes for in terms of you know, as a percentage. You can see that the red bits, right, the, the coding regions, actually really small, 1% or 2% or something really small. The introns are sort of much larger than that. And the whole region is generally very small. The, vast bulk of the genome actually consists of these repeating elements you know, um, that are from old retro transposons or as they call transposable elements. Uh, perhaps uh, Ian or Josh would want to jump in here and explain a little bit about what they are. But it's, the main point is that they're not coding for proteins, okay? but they're occupying space. Uh, they're occupying space because they have managed to insert themselves into the genome and they replicate every time our genes replicate. So I think that's one sorry. of the, the key elements about you know, understanding the transposable elements, although the technical details matter, mm -hmm. what's really important is in contrast to what you talked about with the bacterial genome is that the presence of all these elements tells us that the human genome isn't under the same intense selection, mm -hmm. stay really, really efficient the way the bacterial genome is. It's right. not that, that these are necessarily useful to the to humans, it's that we can't get rid of them because we don't have that hyper-efficient selection going on. And that's going to be important to understanding some of the ENCODE results. Yeah. Excellent. And before we get too far into it, I just want to make a couple notes uh, as well for our viewers out there. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, hang on on air, that you will be, you'll be able to watch us. And you can actually ask us questions and make comments, and we'll be, um, I'll be attending those questions at the very end of the show here. So please feel free to make any comments on the event page through any of the shares on Google+. Plus. I know it's gone out through Science Sunday already. Also, if you're using Twitter, you can use the hashtag HOA or you can also use the hashtag ENCODE, and we will be fielding those 
those as they come in. I'll be jotting them down, and if you need it towards a specific person, just make a note on there. And if you want me to ask a specific person from our panel on any of the questions going on with the ENCODE project, anything as far as defending parts of it or criticizing it, that's what we're here for today, is trying to disseminate what has been released and try to find out why there's controversy and if it's, you know, if it's, you know, reasonable to find it controversial or what, you know, what we can actually take from it from the past and going forward to the future. Now, Budina, you said that you had, did you have more to say, Rajani, as far as with the coding or was... Um, well, the one point we can talk about it now, we can talk about it later. Uh, one of the things that's important is that the size of our genome, the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs long. Uh, that size doesn't seem to matter that much. For example, our genome is about 200 times larger than that of the yeast genome, but then it's about 200 times smaller than that of a certain species of an, an amoeba. So, the, so, uh, so size really does not matter, and the number of chromosomes doesn't seem to matter as well. You know, we have 46 chromosomes, and so there are some species of deer, for example, that just have maybe six and then there are some species of fish, there's a carp that has about 100. So the number of the chromosomes doesn't matter either. Um, and and uh, it's important to realize that even among very closely related species, uh, the number of genes can be the same, but the amount of the DNA, the non-coding part, that varies a lot. So that, again, I think ha will have impact when we begin to discuss the encoding side. So right. perhaps, within you can talk a little bit more about uh, other parts of uh, um, the, um, the the genome, the outside sure. of the genes. Yeah. So the traditional view has always been the proteins that we have are from the DNA, and any changes in a protein is because the DNA changes. So mutations are what drives gene expression. But recently, I guess within the last ten years, this new field called epigenetics has come in, and epigenetics is essentially how genes can change without the DNA code changing. And that's kind of counterintuitive because you always think mutations are the most important part of what determine how a protein works. But if we could pull up the first image we have going. So this is a really great example of epigenetics that I'm sure many people will understand. So here in the center you have a single fertilized cell and that's a zygote. But this can differentiate to give rise to all sorts of different cells that make us up. So you can have red blood cells, smooth muscle, fat cells, neurons, and so on. And if you think about it, the DNA in the nuclei of all these different cell types is identical. The only difference is which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. So that's a really great example, I think, of epigenetics. Would you say that's fairly accurate? or? Okay. I, I think that's the fundamental question of epigenetics that you yeah. know, developmental biologists for decades have been studying that issue of differentiation about how you take cells that have the same DNA information and get yeah. them to become different. It's just only in the last you know decade or two that we've actually started to figure out what the actual molecular mechanism that can that's yeah. making that happen uh, is so. Right, and to, to me as a non-biologist, uh, what I think of when we go into this is that each cell has the same Lego blocks, you know, this big bucket, but they each different type of cell has its own instructions on how to build its own yeah. thing. So you can, you know, throw away these kind of, I'm only going to focus on building the same thing over and over and over again and ignoring the rest of them. That's yeah. that's how I gathered it because I am no biologist. No, so I, I, have to think in bio, I have to think in Lego terms because <laughs> I, I deal with, astronomical objects, not necessarily with So <laughs> think of it as a filter where you're like, I want to build a yellow castle, so I'm going to ignore every single other color. Right. But those other colors are still in the bucket, you're just not using them. Right. And that's um, essentially a very simplified way of what epigenetics is. I'm here is. for simple. I can do simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, worth noting that epigenetics is Oh, there's okay. epigenetics in the cellular differentiation thing okay. where it's you have changes in the way genes are expressed within a single individual as they develop and yeah. then there's the, the the discussion about how many of those 
changes that aren't in the DNA itself um, actually can get passed on to another generation. And yeah. that is the controversial aspect of epigenetics um, yeah. because essentially as a, as a cell that's going to become a gamete, so it becomes a sperm or an egg, goes through the process of meiosis to do that, it essentially all the epigenetic marks in the chromosome are wiped out and then have to be recreated. And so it's very contentious how much of that actually survives that isn't based on the DNA sequence itself. So what you're showing here in the figure is sort of the very uh, non-controversial epigenetics yeah. that developmental biologists have been working on for decades and decades. Yeah. And then there's the more controversial element. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so diving in very briefly into what, how can a cell pick Lego blocks? Um, one of the ways they do this is by having chemical tags. So they put chemical <coughs> tags onto um, DNA and Scott if you could pull up the second graphic so this one for example is a very fantasy like um, DNA strand but essentially it's a DNA strand where the two glowing blobs are methyl groups so these chemical tags act as a signal to the cell saying don't make protein from this bit of me just stop so that gene doesn't get made into RNA and therefore there's no protein so it acts as a you know stop sign um, DNA it's called DNA methylation if you want to look it up and then another way they do it is by um, these regions called promoters that are present at the start of the gene a little bit uh, upstream of it and these promoters act as a signal to the cell when they're exposed so in the cell the DNA is tightly wound up and coiled but when the promoter region is exposed, it's a signal to say, make protein from me, come bind to me, you know, let your RNA polymerase land on me and make transcripts from me to go make protein. And um, another DNA element is, for example, enhancers. And if you could pull up the next um, graphic. So this is a really good diagram because the top um, shows how a linear DNA strand would look. So the orange bit is the actual start of the gene, and a little bit to the left of it is the promoter sequence. And that's just a little bit of DNA that acts as a signal to the cellular, cellular machinery that says, when it's exposed, OK, I'm ready to go. And then you have the enhancer sequence, which is a little bit further upstream of that. And that can bind to various activator proteins. And when the DNA is bent, it can bring all these different protein factors to one location to start this process from going. So these are all different ways that genes can be regulated without needing a change in the DNA sequence, which is again what epigenetics is. Um, does anyone have anything to add to that? Or is that OK? Does that make sense? Anyone? Yeah, that's that makes sense to me. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, what you're talking about, it seems very mechanical, which again helps me as the, yeah. the non-biologist, that it's very much a mechanical yeah. way of approaching it, that they each have their own little purpose going through yes. in, in a linear fashion as it's happening through the process. Yeah. yeah. And lastly, um, one other thing I'd like to talk about, which I don't really have a diagram for because it's really complicated and it's a new thing that's been discovered over the last, 10 years or so is microRNAs and they're really interesting because microRNAs are tiny bits of RNA that are made from the genome from the DNA and what they do is they just they're sequence specific and they once they're made they go throughout the cell and they're like we don't need this protein anymore stop making it so usually they um, work in translational and transcriptional repression and they're really interesting because the human genome has over 1,000 microRNAs and they target about 60% of our genes. So they're a huge part of how we can fine tune gene expression again without needing to change the DNA sequence. The Lego blocks in the bucket stay unchanged. These are all different kinds of filters we can use to choose color, shape, sizes for what we want to build with the Lego blocks in the bucket. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So, so you know the the big the, we're we're trying to do a, a brave, quick and dirty, very quick and dirty intro to genetics <laughs> and how everything breaks down because it's the foundation of what Encode's trying to do. So uh, we've been spending the last you know about twenty minutes here trying to bring everyone as far up to speed as possible with this pretty in-depth um, way of understanding um, yeah. what's going on with the, the human genome mm -hmm. and with, the, with other genetics here. So um, I, we'll be posting some, um, some of the links later on um, after the event's done to help uh, as far as some resources to better understand all these basic steps as we're going into the ENCODE project. And, what you know, what it was trying to accomplish, and what its yeah. results are trying to mean. So this is more of a general, very very broad overview of everything that we were talking about. So we can go into a little bit more detail about encode, and you know, now that we have a basic understanding of what's going on here, what would have caused the controversy from what they were saying and how it was done. Yeah. So if Ian wants to go next and introduce exactly what encode is, we can you know kind of start to get into the nitty-gritty of it. OK, uh, I can <laughs> go ahead here. Um, so ENCODE was, uh, is a, a project in, um, at sort of this international, uh, multi-center, uh, multi-year, multi-hundred million dollar project <laughs> that um, a lot of people are saying is sort of a, a follow-on to the, the Human Genome Project. So 10, 12, 12 years ago? They, they um, sequenced the human genome to, you know, to completion for some definitions of completion. And, uh, um, you know, everyone was excited. We're going to sequence the genome. We're going to find all these genes. There was a pool among scientists. Um, how many genes are there going to be in the human genome? And there was this, this huge variation in, in, um, in the estimates. I think some people were saying 100,000 or 200,000 or there's some that were probably ludicrously high estimates of, of how many genes are going to be in the genome. And uh, so then they, they, they released the sequence. And, and um, I think the, the, I don't remember what the original estimate was. It was something like 29,000 or 28,000 genes. And, you know, there was sort of this, oh, there was only that many genes. And, and people were thinking of equating the complexity of an organism with the number of genes, and we know how many genes are in C. elegans, and we know how many genes are in Drosophila. I think Drosophila is sort of around 20 or 22,000 genes or something like that. Well, I don't recall yeah. correctly, but it's about that. And so while we seem a lot more complicated than a Drosophila, so why don't we have a little more genes than that? Um, and so some people were surprised. I think a lot of people weren't surprised, the people that had actually thought about this and, and thought about how, you know, um, the, the complexity of the genome is, is um, translated into an organism. Um, I, I don't know that everyone was surprised by that, but anyway, there was this. This was one of the big things. We've got 28,000 genes in our genome. They take up about one percent. There's all this other stuff. We don't know what this is. Is it junk? Everyone said it's junk DNA. It doesn't do anything. Um, people that that you know maybe had had looked at junk DNA before 30 years ago, they knew that it wasn't necessarily junk, but, you know, this kind of came up. It's sort of, the junk DNA tends to be this sort of, um, uh, like the Hydra every time, you know, it raises its head and you cut it off and it pops up somewhere else, and so people like I, to I use know it. lots of people hate the word junk DNA. Is it, Scott, would you say it's like the dark matter of biology? Like, it's the term that gets people like, or oh, don't use that word? I Oh, I'd say dark energy. Dark Definitely. matter, we, we mean dark because it doesn't interact with light, so that makes a little bit more sense. But dark okay. energy is literally we're ignorant of what it's doing. And so right. we're in the dark about it, yeah. Yeah. So um, junk DNA just keeps coming up all the time. And yeah, now it's back. Yeah, well, <laughs> so it seems to. Um, anyway, so, so sequence the genome. And then I think in 2004, there was another paper that said we've, now we've really sequenced the genome to another level of completeness, depending on your definition of complete. And, uh, you know, we, the, the, I think the, the, the number of gene estimates went down um, because there's these things called pseudogenes, and you get um, a gene that actually has a function. Sometimes they get duplicated for uh, some reason. They're, they're somewhere else in the genome. There's another copy. Um, it's not doing anything. And so there's no selection against sort of deleterious mutations in it, so it slowly mutates and then it just kind of decays away, but it's still there. They're recent enough that they look like a gene. Um, so those were counted initially, and then as people took more careful 
account of things, they said, well, that, that's probably not a gene. And so I think the number of genes went down, and it hovers. It depends on who you ask where it is. It's about 26,000, I think, right now. Um, and so there's all this other functional stuff, and, and, and you know, we know there's regulatory elements out there, and a lot of them have been found by, you know, on a gene-by-gene -gene basis or on some sort of larger whole genome studies. Um, but there was this, this desire um, to have sort of this uh, comprehensive look at um, uh, the, 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 um, how the genome is used. So aside from the protein coding regions, so these things are the protein, when we say a gene, it's, it's you know, usually we're talking about a protein coding region, um, and we saw sort of diagrams of what they look like. Um, because the DNA is being turned into a protein, and there's this very specific code, the sort of these, these triplet um, DNA uh, uh, bases that encode specific amino acids, they're, they're quite easy to see. So if you've got this huge, long stretch of, of sequence, you can look for these, these stretches of the, the triplets. It's called like an open reading frame. Um, so it's like if you, if you had um, uh, a text that, that's a million characters long and there's no spaces and it's all just crammed together and there's some junk, but if you read through it, then you can start seeing words in English or whatever language you know and say, oh, there's a word there, and okay, now we've got more junk, oh, but here's another word, and it's quite clear to see that. Um, and so the, the, the protein coding genes are easy to find, in, usually. Um, it's all the other stuff, so this regulatory regions, um, and so this, the, the, the ENCODE project, which is, stands for the Encyclopedia of, of DNA Elements, um, was, was started to basically look for this on, on a comprehensive um, basis across the uh, across the genome of the human genome uh, in many different cell uh, types uh, and and using many different um, techniques. So they I think they used 147 different cells. Um, and so these are these are a, a cell line is something that that you take some cells and you propagate it in a in a petri dish and you can grow as many as you want. And usually they're cancer cells or um, uh, embryonic stem cells are kind of something that most people have heard of, and so these are things where you can um, make a lot of it. And, and it's important for these large projects that you want you want everyone to be analyzing the same thing. So they picked a bunch of cells, they um, uh, and they all sort of agreed on what they were going to use, and then and then um, all the participants in the project got um, got these same cell lines, and then they're those were uh, what they were using um, to do the experiments on. And then the experiments were really just sort of these large genome-wide um, uh, uh, techniques that can look for different um, regulatory elements and different uh, modifications to the DNA that can um, that are known to affect uh, um, the regulation of genes, the transcription of genes, um, how the genes are used. So all this other um, all this other stuff, how they're turned on and off, how they're used in different combinations. Um, so this project that I, I, there was a pilot project that that published back in 2007. So it's been it's been ongoing for quite a while. And the pilot looked at one percent of the genome, and sort of refined some of the techniques and refined the uh, um, really how to how how all these different labs were going to work together. Um, and then they scaled up to do the whole genome. So the project is really when you talk about big science and little science, this project really is is sort of the poster child for big science. I think. I don't know if that uh, gives a good uh, introduction. Yeah, I'd say that. So it's, it's, you know, they're trying to, to get a big group of many different large labs, lots of money is being thrown at this to try to get a, a, a deeper understanding of what the, the non-words of your long million character text message is what it's actually trying to say or trying to do or there's meaning behind it. Right, yeah. Because it's out there and, and it's not always obvious. and. Having these many different labs working on it, the different different institutes and different um, centers have specialties. You know, some might be really good at looking at DNA uh, transcription, and some might um, have a lot of, of background in, in histone modifications or um, this, these these uh, chromosome interaction assays. I mean, these are really finicky things to do on a small scale, and when you want to do them on a large scale, it's it's um, it's difficult. So, spreading out the work to kind of try to um, reach everyone's Expertise is, is one way to kind of push it forward. Right. I will. I will say one thing in sort of defense of the encode as the poster child for big science is, in this case, it was really them getting together a large number of individual labs 
to collaborate to do this as opposed to when we sequence the human genome and all the genome sequencing projects where we actually establish essentially large, heavily funded centers to do it. So to a certain, even though it is big science, we actually distributed it in this case among a lot more individual labs than we did when we were in the in sort of the height of the sort of old school genome sequencing effort. So in that way, um, it is big science with sort of a different flavor, maybe a little bit less institutionalized, formally at least, than right. some of the genome sequencing efforts were. So, so uh, what what was it like with the Human Genome Project as opposed to ENCODE as far as the labs? You, do you say there was just one large central, you know, conglomerate, or is it, you know, you're saying now it's being spread up um, among many smaller labs. Was the Human Genome Project something more, I would just say, larger base where it all came from? Well, it was mainly, a, there were a few uh, key genome sequencing centers, um, the Broad, uh, so, yeah. Sanger Center in England, um, Washington University, uh, and just blanking out around, but uh, Baylor. In Baylor in Texas. And they essentially split up the genome into segments and said, okay, I'm taking this one, you're taking... And some of that reflected the technology that was being used, right. the lack of... Um, once you've done a genome of one species, doing another genome of another species becomes a lot easier to put together. The technology has really pushed things in a different direction um, than where they were. But at that time, it was essentially... Um, you know, a couple of institutions, very well funded, splitting it up and going at it at least. And, um, but, and, but some of that was driven by what the technology was and how you okay. had to deal with things. And, right. You know, we progress. So the situation has changed, um, you know, relative to that. So it's hard to say what would, it, it's hard to say what ENCODE would have looked like before that because it couldn't have existed before that. So. Right. Okay, so we have this wonderful resource then that we can all tap into <clears throat> and get information on our favorite genes. Um, and so I think when the uh, papers were published, there were something like 30 papers that were simultaneously published in Science, Nature, and a number of different journals. Um, it was greeted with a lot of enthusiasm by everyone, including the press, um, and that's all very good. Um, and I guess the question now is, um, uh, I think in their enthusiasm um, to um, uh, sort of express this, uh, perhaps uh, the scientists went a little bit overboard in their claims. So could one of you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Okay, I could, <laughs> I could start. Okay. Well, so I mean, uh, they did. There was a, a very controversial statement, and it was, it was made... Um, I guess a couple of times in the main paper. Mm -hmm. So the way the publishing worked is there was sort of one central paper that was um, sort of like the highlight reel mm -hmm. and trying to explain the project in the, in the broad terms and then there was these, these 30, 30 or 35 different um, papers that were kind of um, uh, talking about different aspects of it in more detail. And um, in that main paper there was this comment that, that um, the, the project revealed that 80% of the genome was, uh, had a function. Um, and and it's really the word function, and and the eighty percent, and and um, yeah. how you counted the eighty percent, and and then really um, the the function itself was, and and that caused quite a stir. Right, and and they were very careful to actually use the phrase biochemical function, and uh, as if to say that it was a limited definition of the word function. Um, as defined by a biochemical event, such as a protein binding to a piece of DNA at, in any cell at any time would count as a function. But I will tell you as a biochemist, it doesn't matter to me whether it's biochemical or cellular or genetic, the key word is function. And uh, so the definition, the bar for function is considerably higher. It has to be uh, a consequence to the event. Um, that is perhaps selectable, right, that, that results in something that the organism either values or does not, that can be acted upon by evolution. So I think to go from maybe one or two percent of the genome actually uh, uh, coding for protein, 
on to maybe 10% that includes all the regulatory elements and the different RNAs that we talked about. But now going on to 80%, I think that leap, um, and, and, and actually I think the claim that it could well have been 100%, uh, I think that uh, was took a lot of people by surprise. It's quite the jump. <laughs> Well, and I think there's also, in addition to the main paper, there was an explanatory uh, paper to sort of just discuss the context and the relevance of the ENCODE project by one of the lead co main contributors. And I think, you know, that one actually lended sort of a lot of validity to criticism because that paper does seem to argue that they are equating what a lot of people thought would be a better term, biochemical activity, with function and kind of, you know, trying to change the focus. And, and I think that paper actually argues that it was only, only makes the claim for 40% functionality, but does clearly lay open the, you know, the possibility of it going all the way up to 100%. So it's a very, so I, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of agreement that biochemical activity would be a better choice of, you know, sort of jargon than function, mm -hmm. but I don't think, but I think at least for some of the people contributing to the paper, it was not a, a just a word choice mistake that they were actually trying, you know, that there was some intent to imply function in the way that you're thinking about it, even though that isn't necessarily what their results were really, you know, were, their, their results weren't necessarily supporting that level of, of proof. Okay, so what are the issues then with the term function, and why do why did most scientists think that that was an overreach uh, in terms of the claims? Now, how do we define function? Um, well, I think one there's the very conservative approach, which is that for something to have to define it as function, at least coming from sort of the genomics evolutionary biology, is that you want to not only have evidence of it doing something either in a biochemical assay or in an experiment, but you'd like to see evidence that it has been um, acted on by selection in order to maintain that function mm -hmm. over time. So that's you, you know, prevent, if it's a protein coding gene, to prevent it accumulating mutations that would disrupt the function. And then if you're going to do an experiment, if you can do an experiment where you actually remove that bit of DNA, what you'd like to see is that it has negative, mm -hmm. removing it has negative mm -hmm. consequences uh, for the organism or the species. And so that's, that's the, sort of the most conservative definition. There's some, there's some ways you could get to function that that doesn't quite cover, but they would be sort of very, very rare, such as a new mutation that creates a function in a previously non-functional you wouldn't see, if that was very new, you wouldn't see evidence of evolution having acted upon it yet. Um, and you might not know, and you might not know to, that removing it might not create a significant disadvantage compared to another organism of that species that hasn't acquired that mutation. But that's sort of a, that's a, that should be a very rare event relative to what they're talking about. Right, so the, the fundamental <clears throat> way we would test this in a lab would be um, if A is interacting with B, um, and if we could disrupt that interaction, what is the consequence? If uh, it, there's no consequence whatsoever, um, you have to wonder if, you know, the, the interaction between A and B is relevant at all. Um, the, uh, one of the papers that uh, re rebutted this claim, that we can get to in, in a bit, um, actually had an interesting analogy about the heart. They said that, you know, the heart pump functions as a pump. Uh, to push blood all over our, our body, right? And so that's its primary function. And that's what it's selected for. Uh, but the heart also does other things. It it's, you know, makes a sound. Every time the heart beats, you hear this lub dub lub dub, right? But its purpose is not, you know, it's associated with making that sound. But its function, is, uh, it, it's, its reason for existence is not related to that sound. Uh, and similarly, the heart may occupy space in the chest cavity or it may weigh a certain amount and those are all properties of the heart but they are not the you know functionally relevant properties which is that it's a pump. Right and so you know, I'm seeing here the 
as you know, as I've been trying to research this and wrap my brain around something on, that I don't typically work with, um, but you've gone from having something that okay, one point five percent of this entire thing is what's useful. That's coding. That the coding portion. Everything else is non-coding or junk, and. It, at least this is what I've gathered from it, that they're trying to find connection, like what is going on with the rest of this 98.5%. Is there a purpose for it? Is it just biochemical function? So we know, okay, there is something there, they do something, but not necessarily crucial, because if it's removed or switched around, it's not going to cause a crazy mutation. Is Would that be a, a, a layman's understanding of what's going on here? Yes, I think so. I well, think, I think uh, yeah. um, Go ahead. one of the key things is that the purpose of encode was to sort of use Regini's idea of that you have function and you have properties. Mm -hmm. the, the real goal of encode was to describe the properties mm -hmm. of the genome, to go through and get a really good list of the properties of the genome, and for biologists, that would be a really useful thing. To have that list of properties would be very useful. It does not mean that for what you're researching, an individual property of an individual base pair is actually important or functional, but it would be really useful to know. And one of the tough things here is, what, is that most of the sort of responsible criticism of ENCODE I've seen has either been about sort of big science versus small science priorities or about the conclusions they were trying to draw about the function of the genome from the prop list of properties and that there's very little criticism, at least from the genomics researchers that I know that are planning on using this, of the quality of the work in terms of describing the properties. So it's, the, the issues are with sort of how they decide to analyze and sell their analysis, not the actual fundamental goal of what the ENCODE project was supposed to achieve. Um, Ian, you can disagree with me about that. If you want. That's sort of sure. what I, people I've talked to have, have been telling me. So, Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that they've, um, they, they did what they stated. They would, like, what they, their goal was to, to generate this data set, and, they, and they, I think that they accomplished that. And I think that um, the data is, is, out there, is, is out there. It's very useful. Um, the the issue has been as as you said um, ascribing the function the, the the point of the project as far as I'm aware was never really to ascribe function to anything it was to find um, these regions of the genome that had certain activity that could then be um, could could then inform downstream science so you know we might know that a specific region of the genome is a specific sequence and it binds a specific transcription factor and that is is directly relevant to some gene and that's all been studied previously so they they would take that transcription factor and find where else in the genome it, it binds and you find all these sites and some of them are going to be real and some of them are going to be um, just just false positives and 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 so there's you can debate about you know the thresholds that they've had for sensitivity versus specificity but at the end of the day they've made this um, uh, this data set and they found all these other sites and and the leap that is the main problem is saying that all these other sites in the genome find this transcription factor, therefore they're functional. And the experiments were never designed to actually answer that question. And um, I, I don't. I think that I think that's that's where the main criticism is coming from. Well, it's a they they sort of self-induced uh, controversy, which uh, unfortunately I think has actually distracted from the really difficult technical feat they've achieved, which is generating uh, this gigantic, very you know, useful database and done something that's really actually very hard to do, which is doing a lot of very finicky assays in different, you know, between different labs and doing, you know, getting everyone to do them the same way and get very, getting, you know, reproducible, you know, results in all those different labs. So they really achieved a very difficult technical feat and they, and a lot of that's been lost because of the, you know, sort of a self-induced controversy, but, you know, right. they're trying to make sort of this big claim that that wasn't well, really part of their initial goal. One of the other criticisms I read about ENCODE was that they wanted this massive press release on this day, 30 papers all come out. So there were groups that were told, you know, hold back your 
results don't publish yet and they were kept waiting. And one of the criticisms was, you know, this is taxpayer funded research, you shouldn't get to dictate when things can be released, when things can go out. And although the ENCODE data was freely made available online for researchers to go there, the actual publication disseminating that knowledge, they were held back until everyone was ready for this 30 paper release date. Would you say that's an accurate criticism of it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think you know, pu having the public the publication, you can have all this data, but until you know, until you actually publish it, it goes through peer review. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, so the data is out there. It's it's useful. I mean, the the, the data tracks have been on the genome browsers for quite a while, and you can see. And I, I don't know how frequently it was being updated. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of pressure in in sort of these situations. You've you've got um, funders that have paid. You know, or will have have given you a lot of money, and, and you spent a lot, have spent it all, and um, to make all this 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 data, and you know, you want to um, you want to you want to show that it's worthwhile, and I don't think that's an excuse for selling it incorrectly. But I think that 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 it's a pressure. I think that that you have to um, that may have played some part in in how how it was sold. Is that you know, wow, this is a big thing. We've all spent a really long time on this, and. It's kind of like this. I mean, I think uh, you and Bernie um, called himself the chief cat herder, um, and it's probably similar to that, or you know, like a, this massive marching band, and you're trying to get everyone just to. And I think that they all just kind of cross the finish line at the same time, and there's a sense of relief that we've finally done this, and then they made yeah. some um, comments. Well, in, in the genomics community, I think you know it's felt kind of burnt on the human genome project that. You know, that perhaps it was oversold in terms of the turnover, in terms of you know, how we're going to be able to address disease and everything when we did it, like that this would be a magic bullet. But, you know, you, you're sitting here and you've been part of this big collaboration and you don't want to be the Human Genome Project and being criticized. You've done all this great work and then you're going to be criticized because there aren't big returns on it and, you know, or things are going to be trickling out or, you know, your impact, your real impact is going to be over like the next decade, you know, being cited a lot and being a database that people use all the time in their papers. And the, but just like the Human Genome Project is, and but nobody really, but you as the project haven't really generated anything that made that that same kind of splash. So I think I think there's some, and there may have been some concern about trying to wanting to make a splash so that they. It didn't look like sort of no, another I, thing like the Human Genome Project, right. sort of publicly, even though the scientific community treasures having the Human Genome Project and the, the things that it's produced every single... I mean, I, at graduate school, I don't know if there was a day that went by that I wasn't using something that came from the Human Genome Project. And I think a lot of it, too, comes into, you know, it ends up being marketing and public relations. And then unfortunately, if you are doing anything that's funded by the public, you do need to make the public care about what you're doing, even if they have no idea what you're doing. Uh, I, I know in my fields that you have to be very creative with how you present something to the public because we're all excited about what we're doing. You know, we see the importance of it and the, the, the grand revelations we're getting from the science that's being done. But ultimately, you need to get the public support behind you, and sometimes you do have to do silly publicity stunts because people are too focused on watching Justin Bieber than to actually care about understanding who we are as a species and how you know the biochemistry works, or you know, in, in my my case, as far as how the universe has come to be. These are huge questions to our species, yet trying to get people's attention to care about that. There, there is a double-edged sword that, that they wield, and I think they didn't wield it correctly if you oversell something, even though you've made an amazing, you've done an amazing job as far as science goes, but if you use that double-edged sword and chop your foot off, you're going to be limping for a while until someone grabs another one onto you. Mm -hmm. And they did fairly well with ENCODE because they got a video made with Tim Minchin. Now yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you can say from a marketing perspective, it's actually a lot easier to get a lot of attention by sort of sticking your foot in your mouth. Yeah. And then it then it is by actually doing things the right way, which is somewhat unfortunate because they wouldn't have there would have been much less attention 
had they just ever you know not done something that got everybody mad at them it would, well, just, it would just make people complain about big science not you know yeah, there's no there's no such thing as bad publicity right you know you're still getting people to <laughs> to talk about you and see what's going on unfortunately yes <laughs> And, well, perhaps and, we as scientists should learn to market our stuff in a more honest and forthright way and not have to make claims that uh, sort of exceed the, uh, uh, you know, the limits of credi credibility. Um, yeah. And so that's also a problem. It, oh. it's, 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 our, 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 it's a scientist's fault. It's, it's a fault of the science writers out there who uh, should really be reading the papers. You know, if they have a college degree or a PhD, they should be reading the papers and writing their own assessments and not be taking words from the mouths of the authors who are selling this inflated view of their work. So I don't sympathize with that either. I think all well, the science writers I think, contribute. I think on the converse side of it, it's a showing how <clears throat> scientifically illiterate our society has become that no. you, no one cares or no one has any idea. Like it, I am not that you know adept as far as understanding biology, but I can at least know how to look a word up if I don't understand it. Yeah. But most people won't go that distance of actually trying to understand what's going on. And so when it comes to relating information to it, even even someone it, you know grade fourteen, and they have a bachelor's degree, but most of the time they they won't put forth that effort. And so it is a challenge to try to get that information out there because the majority of the time, no, unless you're within that field or a complete nerd on that subject, which is, I mean that in a loving way because <laughs> I love my nerds, but un unless you're really, really interested in something, most people won't go out of the way to discover the, the depths of what some new research means. And so it's, it's, it's hard to be really, really passionate about what you're doing and what you're discovering but also having it fall on billions of deaf ears every every single day, and trying to find the way of, of relating how important it really, really is to us. Well, I think this, uh, in part of our research, having you know, need to have even more value on uh, professional science communicators that have very deep experience in the science, but are talented communicators in between uh, the the scientists and uh, even the journalists, because for example, on this, I actually have great sympathy for the science writers on this one because with the thirty paper deluge that they got, a lot of them, if you did not have very deep technical knowledge of what was going on, you, you almost stood no chance and didn't have much opportunity to do other, anything other than a rough cut. I mean, I know, you know, the the people who are going to be using it are still wading through. Papers, so that's a, you know, it's a very difficult task, and to a certain extent, you know, most science writers had very little choice than just to, you know, go with what they were being being told, um, especially if they didn't have, they didn't know who to, uh, you know, somebody else to go and ask um, about things. You know, people, those are people hear about junk DNA, and we talk about it like it's a problem with the genome. But, you know, and even a lot of scientists do, but in actuality it is uh, junk DNA is something that evolutionary, for in humans, is something that evolutionary biology in our actually predicts. If it, we didn't have junk DNA, it would mean there's something wrong with our understanding of evolutionary theory. And so that, so, you know, what they're making is actually to people without understanding, was like that's a very bizarre claim because it means we have to rewrite, you know, our evolution textbooks, not uh, kind of thing. So, um, I'm down for rewriting textbooks. I mean, I I think that's important. <laughs> Which I, ones? Yeah, right. All, you know, I, I think that's the biggest point of science, though, is you're discovering new things all the time. You have to be willing to throw out an old paradigm if it's proving to not be relevant anymore. Um, because we're we're finding and discovering new things all the time, and if it can be verified that it's accurate and it's not just a uh, you know a publicity stunt, or if it's not something just to to you know wag someone's flag saying hey I'm I'm a big awesome scientist or I'm a big awesome lab or observatory, 
I, I think it's important is that we need to be willing to rewrite the rules because we've discovered that there's new rules involved. Um, but and there's a lot of people that do get stuck in their trench on something that even for the the right reasons they're still in the wrong you know they they're still in the wrong about it and it's great to have uh, you know not wanting to flinch on what they feel has been tried and true science but since we're understanding nature in in more in depth ways every single every single day let alone every single year I think it's important to be open but also be skeptical and being able to balance those out. Well, I don't I don't object to rewriting textbooks and but I mean in this case this was you know there's it's what it, what it, what I really mean is that you can rewrite the textbooks but if you're going to sort of if you're going to make a claim that invalidates sort of everything we've learned up till now you you know, you need to have really strong evidence, and the problem Absolutely. was is they didn't have that. And I, I probably should clarify, what I'm referring to is that when that we refer to that the human genome has somewhere somewhere between five and fifteen percent of the genome, so like one and a half, two percent codes for proteins, but somewhere in the ten to fifteen percent range is under selection. So that means evolution is acting to keep the sequence the way it is because it works well. Um, and, that, and there's other kinds of selection, but that's the one that's easiest for us to detect. And so that's why there, and that's part of why there's some variation in the number. But we also expect there to be a lot of chance things that go on and right, right. mutations. And in a, in a species like humans, the way the population structure is, we expect that those chance events are often going to sort of dominate the evolutionary dynamics. And so that means that when we accumulate these extra bits of DNA, like transposable elements, we aren't going to be very good. They'd have to be pretty detrimental to the organism that has it for us to get rid of them. And so, and that's something, whether it's a transposable element coming from a retrovirus or some other source, that's something that we'd actually, essentially, evolutionary theory would predict to have happen. So if you don't have that in a species like humans, it either means there's something wrong with our theory or we're sort of misunderstanding the structure of the species and its history. Um, and so that's why their sort of claim of everything being functional is real, you know, was almost sort of more fundamentally shocking, I think, to people that are in the field than... Yeah. than than just the initial, it had a fair amount of shock value and then it had even more shock value if you're really immersed in that field because it's sort of telling you that everything you know is wrong. And that could yeah. be true, but you, again, you need ex sort of extraordinary evidence and they weren't, they were bringing an extraordinary data set, but they weren't bringing extraordinary evidence for that claim. Yeah. And one of the things that's um, really interesting is if you take a gene from a human and you line it up with a fruit fly and a worm and a mouse, the protein bits are, say it's an important protein, it's very similar. You can do an alignment of a protein with like the DNA sequence and you can see it hasn't changed. And that's the exons, the coding bits that Rajni was talking about at the start of our hangout. But if you look at the non-coding bits, there's a lot more variation. And, you know, if it's important, it shouldn't change. And I think that's what the whole selection thing was and one of the criticisms. If um, if the only non-changing bits are the protein coding bits, then the other bits that do change, how can they still be important? Because surely if they're important, evolution would have kept them the same throughout. Would you say that's a fair assessment of that criticism? Mm -hmm. You've gotten quiet, Ian. I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, that that's true. I mean, like the 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 the, the protein. I mean, that's that's how initially a lot of these um, these uh, genes are found. You're looking for conservation. Um, yeah. Certainly, when we're you know I'm, I'm looking at mutations in, in someone's genome, like you, you you take a look at the part of the protein that that's being changed, and you say, well, this is conserved all the way down to fruit flies, so it's probably an important amino acid. So, um, you know, that makes me more suspicious of this change because you've got these, uh, 
you kind of change it there versus somewhere else where even in mouse it's different, then you're not, not as worried about it. So. It, gets, it gets a little messy when you start talking about the regulatory regions because there's research from different labs where you can look across species or experimentally manipulate species and they can have tra transcription factors, so proteins that bind the DNA that help control whether, when and where a gene is expressed and the places they bind can move around and all over the place, they can drop out against, and then sometimes you still have, you know, the similar looking expression pattern. So the way the gene is, where the gene comes on and where it's off, can be the same. Um, they can be the same, different, unchanged, and it it gets it's it's much easier to find the signature of sort of selection and evolution when you're looking at the protein than it is in the regulatory region. So they can get you know, very messy and difficult to to analyze. So that's sort of the caveat on on that. Right. Well, I'm going to uh, start pulling up some of the questions here, and then we can try to make it. Uh, I know that, Rajani, you have an event that you need to attend to as well. So we don't want to keep you on. So if you do need to drop out, please feel free. You're not okay. being too rude. Just a okay. little rude. No. And it's for, si it's for science, sir. So. It is for science. That is yeah. true. Um, but we're pulling up the questions here, and um, there's a question you're saying, does, uh, does there exist anything resembling a non-living ribosome, perhaps a precursor of living ones? Anybody want to jump on that? Non-living, uh, well, like a non-biological ribosome? That's I what I'm... ribosomes, non-living. Non um, Maybe not. it's the RNA world um, hypothesis. The there are people that are working on variants of sort of RNA, RNA based enzymes that I think can I, they can do some of those functions. I think they tend to focus more on getting an RNA that actually will replicate itself. Um, a lot of the theory for the RNA world is if you can find something that efficiently replicates itself, uh, so an RNA that um, goes through the reaction efficiently and is and with relatively good fidelity, then almost everything else is, you know, would probably have happened. And once you can get that replicator, then almost everything else probably uh, would have happened. Um, so, but I, I don't know if they, I don't, so I think that's where most of that research is focused or in, and then being worried about what can, then trying to figure out what conditions under which sort of those reactions would happen most efficiently, and if those would have, you know, when and where those would have existed. Ian, anything yeah, to add? Uh, I can't really add anything to that. No? I think that sounds great. Awesome. Um, and, and here's actually a, another question here. So, would it be easy? Excuse me. Would it be easier or more possible for synthetic genomics to be to bring to life genomes that do not contain junk DNA? Yes. Um, Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Isn't that what yeah. Craig Venter is doing? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, a lot of synthetic genomics is all on you know single-celled organisms, um, and as Josh already mentioned, they don't have a lot of that because they're they're replicating so quickly, and and um, mm -hmm. it's like if you're constantly packing and moving every day, you're gonna just mm -hmm. either forget stuff and leave it behind, or you're gonna decide that you couldn't be bothered, and and mm -hmm. after a while, you don't have a lot of stuff anymore. So. Um, I don't. I think we're a long way from making synthetic multicellular organisms. That right. Well, and uh, so the lab I did my graduate work in, and a, a bunch of other labs have been doing a lot of research using where they synthesize sort of random strings of DNA to try to analyze regulatory functions um, and other things like that. And one of the the real things that they've that these people have found is that it's actually and this plays directly into the ENCODE results about junk DNA, is it's actually very difficult to generate a random string of DNA of any length. Um, and we're talking, you know, 10 base pairs that doesn't have biochemical activity. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can be very hard to make a random piece of DNA that doesn't do something if your assay is sensitive, sensitive enough. enough. So that's a potential... So it could be very hard to, you, you might want to put in junk DNA that's neutral into your synthetic organism, but it's actually going to be very difficult to find 
sets that don't do anything unless you're just, you know, taking wholesale, perhaps from junk DNA in the human genome. But in the human genome, it actually has a lot of processes that go into make some of those repetitive elements and that junk DNA and transposable elements stay junk and stay neutral. Um, so that's, so it's, there's some, there, it, the DNA is not necessarily completely neutral on its own, from its own devices. The human genome kind of fights back against the, the junk to keep it in check, to keep the junkyard in order. And I think it's really interesting because you can, you kind of need the variation because think of our, you know, hypothetical synthetic organism that's fully streamlined, doesn't have any junk. If the weather changes or there's this new pathogen, it doesn't have the equipment in it to evolve resistance because, you know, all it has is what it needs for right now. And I think that's a big part of why we have so much junk because we need to kind of keep evolving to, it's the whole, you know, keep running to stay in the same spot thing. I've seen a lot of science fiction movies, so I'm not sure we actually want our synthetic organisms to be that robust <laughs> to, to environmental yeah. change. Oh, we'll be fine. But, Come on. <laughs> We're just a sense of adventure. What could go wrong? <laughs> so I, I had a question, actually, um, for, for both of you, uh, and if you guys could actually both answer it. But what, what do you, your personal opinions, um, I, I guess, allowing you to be as uh, brutal as you care to be on, you know, your support for ENCODE and also your criticisms for it and what, if, if you had the ability of redoing the project, what would you have added or not had them do? Um, I'll, Josh, go first and then yet yeah, Ian, if you want to follow up. Um, I mean, I think in general, I think on the technical aspects of what they were doing, their goals, the real actual goals of ENCODE, I think they've um, done a very good job. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, we could come up with some really technical quibbles here and there about priorities and stuff. Um, my, I mean, for me, I mean, I think in I mean, what we're criticizing in code a lot for is, um, you know, the way they, they presented what they were doing and the, the sort of the, the need to come up with an analysis of their database as opposed to just going, look at this database we, we created. This is awesome. Um, yeah, but a lot of that is tied into how we fund and give credit for research. Um, I mean, I think a lot of this is what it's saying is we need some of these big science projects because there's technical data collection, um, th things we want to do where big science is really good. I mean, it's a little bit like astronomy. Like sometimes you need a big telescope. Right. Sometimes you need a telescope in space, and that's a big project. But you also want a lot of input from small, you know, sort of individual creative researchers. And right now we've been kind of going down the route of you either have to be a big part of the collaboration or you can wait to see what the results are. And trying to balance really fantastic data collection that these and pushing technology forward like these projects have done with a lot more input from, you know, the individual creative scientists and being able to spread out the credit so that ENCODE can get tons of credit, justified credit for building a really good data set. And then the individual researchers can get a lot of credit for taking that data and using it creatively in, in separating the two things. And our sort of traditional publishing system is sort of like, you have to generate the data, come up with the, come up with the question, come up with the experiment, do the experiment, and analyze it all in sort of one fell swoop and it's like well right. you can give credit for each one of those steps right um so i think ultimately uh you're gonna need to have small science step in and provide the in-depth you know uh, dissection of the information and give the mechanistic detail and the implications of what big science is observing so uh, you know obviously what we need is a balance of both approaches yeah you know, I'm, you know, I'd like for entertainment value to, to disagree with Josh, but I think I, I agree with him. <laughs> oh, come on. Said. That's why we brought you on to um, fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's late to tell me that. Um, you know, I, I, I we think, can do it again. That's fine. Okay. I've got time. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I, 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 you know, I think that the, 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 the data set and how they, how they approached actually generating it, sort of doing the science itself, I think that they, they I mean, it would be, I would be, have trouble finding things to criticize. I mean, uh, you know, people have said that they, there's, uh, it's too sensitive, and so there's too many false mm -hmm. positives, and, and, um, and, you know, there's all this, this um, non-real signal in there. That you, but I think that, that that's for other people to sort out down the road, and, and you know, it's a, it's a scientific quibble. Um, I think really the the main thing that I would do differently, and I think probably everyone would do differently, is is really how they how they sold it as far as this eighty percent figure, um, and and trying to kind of do this analysis. And um, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on on these groups to actually just not just generate a bunch of data and put it out there for other people to use, but just sort of try to explain why it's important. We just spent five years and and millions of dollars. Um, and there was a couple of papers that came out, which I think you know, kind of got this on everyone's radar, that were very um, um, critical. And these are sort of published, peer-reviewed papers that that um, one in particular was was rather scathing and, and derogatory in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and and the author of that paper actually said in the in the um, I think it was in the Guardian or something, he was quoted as saying that um, this was not the work of scientists. This was the work of badly trained technicians. Um, and he, I, 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 that was quoted, and so I, I think that that's. I mean, that that was not in the paper. I would hope that that a um, you know a co-author or, or a, a reviewer might say, do you, do you really want to say that? But um, I mean, he's he, he's got a history of, of of you know strong statements in in in, in uh, published work in the past. But I mean, I think that that um, he said that. I think a lot of people think that as well with these these sort of these genome centers. You know, if you think of astronomy, it's saying, well, they're not really scientists. They just point the telescopes and right. take the pictures, and then we're actually doing the science. Oh, I wish. That would be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sign me up. Um, you know, the, 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 this criticism is const constantly out there, and, so, and there's, there's this pressure. You can't just publish, we sequence the genome of a cancer cell now. You have to, you know, have a lot of validation and, and, and some, some really put some meat on the bones, so to speak. And, right. Um, so I think that that really how they how they try to communicate it. I think it's really a failure of science communication in some ways, and and the pressures that they have, and and um, and how they how they tried to deal with that. And, and I think that maybe it's um, for future big projects having kind of the communications team uh, maybe at arm's length from them, um, access to all the groups, and and really kind of um, think through the strategy a bit more. Right. Uh, might might be you know. For, for ENCODE, the sequel, which is coming, I guess, that um, maybe they might want to... ENCODE 2, getting <laughs> deeper in the genome. I think for, just for, for balance, like that the, the quote about, I, I don't know if this is, if the, if, well, the scientist technician's quote, he claims he was misquoted oh, okay. on that. I, I, it, That's quite the misquote. It does not, but... Having looked at that paper closely, the snideness of the comment is, even if it's a misquote, is in keeping with the tone of of his peer-reviewed critique um, of the uh, of encode. So that's that's worth saying, and it's also worth saying that, like, I mean, I know a, a huge number of people that were actually involved in encode, and you know, these are good common science and it's often kind of weird when you see the you know sort of this big splash publication of of the of the results that often what's you know coming out doesn't quite match up with sort of what you know about that person as an individual and it kind of shows you know there's always this issue of how somebody is and um how they're, how, you know, and what winds up coming out of a sort of this group collaboration effort that is sort of a whole series of compromises um, that they, you know, decisions that they may not make as they're, uh, you know, on their own. Um, right. Very good. Well, I, I want to take time to thank you guys for, for hanging out with us on Sunday and, and being able to let us explore the... Uh, the fundamentals of, of genomics, but also going into the ENCODE project and its strengths and weaknesses and uh, just some of the controversy going on. Uh, if, if you guys want, please uh, let us know where the, our viewers can find you on the Internet besides just Google+, Plus. if you guys have a web page or on Twitter or anything like that. Uh, Josh has got a blog. 
I like it. <laughs> I read his <laughs> blog all the time. Um, I don't have anything other than Google Plus. No. Google Plus is awesome, though. Keep yeah. putting stuff on Google Plus, yeah. Who needs anything else? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Josh, where, where's well, your blog at? Okay, well, I, I run the uh, I run the the Finch and P, uh, the online pub for science. So it's uh, it's not just I, I run it, but we have um, I think we're a number of other authors, um, you know, active research scientists in in the genomics field, researchers on science education. Artists, uh, we have a chef um, nice. writing about food science, so it's a it's a real hodgepodge of stuff. But we do have a uh, because uh, the co-founder and I both come from the genomics genetics uh, background. We we have a we've had a, a deep interest in encode and sort of the controversy going around it. So right, that, that's something that keeps seems to keep rearing its head uh, <laughs> right. there. Um, um, and you can also find, follow me on Twitter at Josh Witten. So. Josh Witten, very good. Roger, do you can find more of you? Well, you can always find me on Google Plus, and you can also uh, follow me on Twitter at Madam Scientist. And I Madam have, Scientist. And yeah. I have a foodie blog called Madam Scientist Not So Mad Amusing. <laughs> but I try but don't to in, at... interject uh, science into food. Mm. But don't look at her blog when you're hungry, because yes. that's a bad idea. Okay. That's true. <laughs> Budini, how about yourself? Um, mostly on Google+. Twitter at Dr. Half Pine Buddy. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I, Rajni and I curate Science Sunday, so if you haven't already, you should add Science Sunday to your circle. Yes, do. There's a lot of awesome stuff that's going on in Science Sunday. Um, I'm Scott Lewis from KnowTheCosmos.com, part of CosmoQuest, the National Sphere New Media Association. Uh, we've been collaborating here on trying to get more uh, Google Plus Hangouts on air with all sorts of different uh, science topics. So again, thank everybody, thank our viewers, thank our guests for coming out today to discuss um, ENCODE with us. Uh, we'll be doing the virtual star party in Three and uh, three hours, so I have to actually drive across town to go to the observatory for that. But uh, thank everybody for for the questions, for the plus ones and the shares, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.